Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Art Salon at Art Basel. My name is Peter Dorshenko. I'm the executive director of the Dallas Contemporary in Texas. Uh, for the next 30 minutes, we'll be, I'll be in conversation with Irvin Verm. Then we will open up to uh, questions and answers uh, for a few minutes afterward because I think it's important that those of you that may have seen the exhibition at the Bass Art Museum uh, may have specific questions to ask uh, Erwin Verm directly. Uh, I think it will add to the whole experience here. The exhibition at the Bass that I just mentioned uh, was a year and a half long process in um, working both with the institution here in Miami and also with my institution in Dallas, where the exhibit will go to after um, its uh, time here in Miami Beach. It was a conversation with Irvin in terms of how to uh, create a story, to create a focus, and I think that the exhibition, especially those of you who have seen it, is uh, the most focused uh, to date. Uh, my initial interest in uh, the exhibition, which most of the works are uh, fairly relatively new, made in the last year, some of them a year and a half, never, most of them never seen before, uh, really dealt and focus in on the home or the dwelling. I think this is a theme that uh, Irvin Verm has used for quite a long time, over 15 years, but it's really kind of come to a, uh, a focal point with the exhibit. The exhibition starts with uh, a element of performance at the ramp. You go up the ramp, you see two sweater pieces almost engaged in um, being part of the building in a humorous way, kind of almost keeping that part of the building warm. Then you go into first gallery and you have a series of drinking sculptures, wallpaper, it really kind of creates an environment. Um, with those uh, drinking sculptures, they literally are for drinking. They're inverted pieces of furniture, cabinets, credenzas, um, inverted into a new shape, a new form, still functional, but for the opening and first day this week, they actually had uh, spirits, hard liquor, where anybody who came to the opening or the day after could partake and open a cabinet, have some tequila, some whiskey, some Campari, and uh, become, be part of that performance process. Performance process with the drinking sculpture uh, only concludes when you're drunk. Um, and uh, the works are, are, are humorous and, and have a, this level of black humor to them, but they're also kind of serious because each piece is named after an artist such as de Kooning, Kippenberger, uh, Munch, who had drinking problems or literally the alcohol killed them. So there's two sides of that story um, with each sculpture. Also what makes it interesting is just like the ramp where there's a, a cartoon on uh, a famous photograph of uh, Giacometti walking in the rain and pulling his jacket over his head, uh, almost a Beavis and Butthead style. Um, you, you become part of the, that whole process. You become an actor or actress in many of these environments that Verm creates for us. And lastly, in the larger space, you have a series of these larger sculptural um, shapes and forms which are not human, they're not building, there's something, uh, some, uh, basically a gray area in between where you start walking around and it really, that gallery has been turned into uh, basically a, a stage of sorts. And these shapes and the sculpture that are there are much like going to an opera and you see, you know, a boulder or a stage set and it looks so heavy but it's really not. That's why a lot of the works, including the plinths, are foam, and we're not, the artist has not hidden that 
whole process, so everything looks temporary. But yet at the same time, there are a lot of the smaller sculptures that deal with um, the whole aspect of the dwelling or the home, such as the melting Mies van der Rohe building. Um, there's a series of new hoodie works that basically it's the same kind of hoodies that are very popular with uh, youth and, and um, in the UK to hide themselves, to create mischief, but yet they're, they're bronze. So the aspect of clothing in the dwelling, in the home, in the space, is really the, the kind of mixture or chaos that's created in that space. But what I'd like to do is um, have Irvin explain his whole, because a lot of his work harks back to certain periods of time over the last 10, 15, 20 years, maybe even a little bit longer, with performance, with kind of one minute sculptures. And I, what I'd like for him to do, because I've created this context for a conversation here, is to kind of explain that process from the early 80s to the Bass show, so you have a better understanding of why the artist is doing what he's doing. Well, everything is said already. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you know, every work has um, uh, a beginning and an end. And I decided that in, in the late 70s and um, early 80s, when I started to think about sculpture, it actually, it actually happened through, uh, by coincidence. I, was, uh, I tried to get into the art school and study painting. I was very much involved in painting and loved being a, would have loved being a painter. But they didn't accept me in the painting class. They put me in the sculpture class. And therefore, this was the first shock. And out of this um, kind of catastrophe, I started to um, think about and research sculpture. What does it mean to make a sculpture? What is it at that time? Um, to three-dimensional time, mass, volume, surface, um, skin. And time means uh, every piece of art has a, a, a beginning and an end. But as Michelangelo said, he wants to create sculptures which somebody can throw down, roll down a mountain and they would still be alive and would still survive and they should last forever, eternities. And um, to the understanding of our time, I found this doesn't fit so much because we're, we're such a um, consuming society and threw things away constantly. So I thought it would be interesting to add the end of the art piece as an, as an important part of the piece it by itself. And so I started to think about these, um, uh, I later called them one minute sculptures. I created first a series of um, pieces with instructions, so actually sweaters. And I used sweaters because a sweater is a piece of cloth and it doubles the surface of the body. It's a second skin, so to say. And so um, it's, it's an abstract form in a way, an abstract shape but with the reminiscence to a human body and the human form. So it always speaks about the absence of uh, a person or the absence of a human body. And um, with these people I created a, a series of works which were um, constructed under the uh, impression I would like to, I, I wanted like to show something where the, the way of doing is very important. So that's also the reason why I I, I created the instruction drawings for these pieces. So I could send basically uh, a normal sweater to San Francisco or to whatever, China, and a gallerist could, after my instructions, realize the piece, hang the piece on the wall, and through these very, very um, easy and simple uh, hanging instructions, uh, uh, I would say the, um, the object um, transformed into an art piece and intro transformed into something else. And I always had this reminiscence to famous art artists and famous artworks like I made the urinal, for example, the hanging urinal of Dijon uh, uh, through a sweater. And uh, this was the beginning. <laughs> and, and your examination of dealing with the, the home has always been there. You've dealt with people that hoard food. You dealt with the whole process of um, twins, this whole aspect that always somehow comes out of the home. 
Yes, when, uh, I mean, this also comes from, I would say, pragmatic reason at the very beginning. When you're a young art student and um, no money and no possibilities, I tried to, uh, I more or less decided for myself, if I, I always wanted to make a living out of my work and not having to, having to have another job besides and um, earn money for the living. So I was very interested just to do this one thing in my life, to make art and be able to live out of it. Of good or, good or bad, it doesn't matter, but just be able to live uh, from this. So I, I realized this I can only do with when I use cheap materials, when, when I have nearly no production costs. And then uh, it, it became, um, I became uh, interested in using pieces, materials, objects, what I found close to my area, close to my studios. And for co some coincident reasons, I, I had a studio together with other, other artists and this was close to a, a wood shop where people threw wood away and I was the first sculptures I did, uh, I, I made with this uh, wood pieces. And then, not to forget, in the 70s, uh, it was the time, uh, the time of um, conceptual art, minimalism, little pop art, um, figurative sculpture was nearly banned out of everything, so fi figurative culture was not interesting. Interesting, and I have read um, if someone, if an artist wants to wants to succeed or um, writer or whatever wants to succeed, you have to you have to go beyond your fathers, or you have to leave your fathers uh, away, the father figures or the mother figures away, and. Um, so that meant for me I shouldn't do what the teachers uh, were telling us, this whole, whole thing about minimalism and conceptualism and that it was absolutely um, not right to make figurative sculpture. So I started to make figurative sculpture because of this reason with this old wood, pieces of wood, which I found there and uh, I created these classical figures like standing sculptures, like in the Renaissance, standing sculptures, horse riding, um, yeah, and so on and so on. But what was the question? <laughs> uh, it's okay. Um, to still going back to the home, I think you're uh, you're well known at least through uh, images through the press on Fat House that was um, shown internationally in many different locations. I mean, very quite humorous, but has a serious tone to it. And then it's not th humorous. It's not about humor, not at all. I always re I always hear and read. It's about humor, not at all. Not at all. Some people found it funny, mm -hmm. but in general, to me, it's, it has to do with catastrophe. It has to do with with um, a tragic part of our lives and our uh, and our presence. But coming back to the to the daily life, when I changed studio, uh, I at that time I I always used these materials what I found in the new surroundings, and this brought me to the idea: Why don't you use uh, the objects what? around you in the daily life means mm -hmm. everything the chair the table the glass the watch the shoes the pants and so this was the next step and um, combining this with the idea of short living mm -hmm. sculpture like uh, a sculpture has a beginning and an end i created the one minute sculptures after a certain amount of years and the first time when i did the one minute sculptures was i was i got an invitation to a, um, a realizer show in bremen in germany and uh, I didn't send anything, no materials, no, no pieces there. But I just came there 10 days in advance and started, I came with the, with the idea to realize the one minute sculptures. And I was able to uh, use all the materials, what I found there, plus the people who was working in this Kunstverein, the director and uh, secretary and so on, curator. And I tried everything first out with myself by video. And then I, th I saw it, some, I mean, it, it, it was, a lot about also a dysfunctioning and failing and um, mistreat and embarrassment and uh, ridiculousness and all this stuff. But I found it so interesting to let it enter the world because all of a sudden it was something what was touchy, which which got me really re really deep. Before that, I always had the idea: me as a young artist, I'm standing there and looking up, and there is the line, the level of high art and high philosophy and I never could connect to this. I tried it hard but it was always artificial in a way. And when I started with this series all of a sudden something um, became very connected, very close, very direct and very intense. And um, this was the time with the one minute captures. But also from the very beginning I wanted to create a body of art 
which is um, connected into different areas. So I started, for example, with the real 3D sculptures, as we said. Then I made drawings, performative pieces. Then I started to make um, photography through video because when I made these short living sculptures, I asked for a certain time, I asked people to put sweaters on their body uh, in a very unusual way. It was a lot of playing also. And uh, I filmed these figures for 20, 20 seconds and then I added this. And um, at the end, the film was an hour and you saw many, many short living sculptures coming and going, coming and going, coming and coming and going. And um, this I found so interesting through the because I, I needed the video because I wanted to show when someone is standing there with a sweater on over his head, you see him moving a little bit. And I found this important that people could see there's a person in it. Mm -hmm. And then w I made, um, how do you call it, the still, the still how you, you take a still from the video. Yes. Yeah, and I saw this in the photographs and I thought, wow, it's actually a nice photograph. So why don't I make a photograph without the step through the video? So this is the way how I came to photography and to video. And, but they all, everything was related to sculpture. So for that reason, I called also everything sculpture, sculptural work. Yeah, and, and this I wanted to finish. So I started with all these different um, methods like real 3D sculpture and drawing and video and photography and performance and text. So, and then I could um, work, develop the different areas um, not dependent from each other. So when I created the one minute sculptures, I also was doing real 3D sculptures, but the public or the art world was just focusing the, the one minute sculptures. And then when I came up with the fat car, people were surprised. Uh, they said, well, how, how does this go together? But it's all, it was always the idea to relate the notion of sculpture to the social aspect. Mm -hmm. So for example, when you, um, when somebody makes a sculpture with clay, he adds volume or he takes volume away. When I gain weight or lose weight, I also add volume or I take volume away. So I could also say to gain or to lose weight is a, is a sculptural work. And this brought me into a whole, inter whole interesting uh, field. And that's also the reason why I, for, for example, combined car, a technical system with a biological method of gaining weight. So all of a sudden the result was the fat car. And then when I saw the fat car, the first one was um, a car from, I bought very cheap from, from uh, one of my assistants. I've realized the car all of a sudden got through making the form uh, may, um, in a way destroying the form, expanding the form. Um, this um, created a human aspect in the car. It, it became a face. Mm -hmm. And then the next step was, wow, I saw there is a face now and why do I not let the car speak? And um, this was the next step was to create this video, uh, Fat Car Talking, and also the Fat House Talking afterwards. And this was the ability to, sh to show content. So the car, the art piece spoke about its own relation and its own conditions. And this was very imp important for me at that time. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time in this past uh, summer in Venice, you had something a little bit more, more stilted, more architectural with the narrow house. Uh, how did, how, what's the jump? What's how? How did you achieve that component there? Well, the narrow house um, is not a skinny house. So there's the fat house. This is related to the obesity, the growing, the deformation, deforming uh, a shape in a way, humanizing um, te technological systems. And with the narrow house, I'm. I wanted to, well this was an idea which I had since a very long time. I, I, I took my parents' house basically and uh, it's a real house, it's a real size of a house. And um, I wanted to uh, work about a special architecture in a certain time, 70s, 60s and 70s in Austria because it created um, a very special society or the society created these kind of houses so there was a um, uh, how do you say it, um, connection between the idea of a house and the outcome of, they were actually not built by architects, they were anonymous houses. Those are the first industrial houses which were built by, um, in Austria. 
anonymous bad architecture. And this I found um, a very strong statement for a certain society because those houses were growing, growing amazingly and more or less like cancer destroying the countryside and, and, and the country. And they also produce a certain, I would say, uh, ability of um, uh, psychologi psychological ability because they, through the aesthetics and through their um, social connotation and relation, they create this very specific and very strange atmosphere to my taste. Now, that's at that time when I grew up in this house, I didn't realize it, of course. And um, looking back, it, it has these strong effects on me. So I wanted to show that this society was rigid in a way, was narrow and close. So I had the feeling it, it would be good. Like, um, it's related also to, um, to um, I forgot the name now. Such a famous artist that I forgot the name. <laughs> Bruce Nowell. Bruce Nowell. <laughs> his, uh, remember his uh, hallway where it's, you can walk through and you see yourself walking and it's very narrow. So I wanted to create a similar piece um, in relation to this. So I created the narrow house. And again, it's a real house with a roof. It's a saddle roof. It's 20 meters long, but it's reduced to one sixth of its real width. So it's one meter wide or one meter ten wide. And you, when, when you enter the room, it's, uh, when you enter the house, there are all the rooms in there and, and all the furniture and everything is squeezed. So you see the parents' bedroom, long, but very thin. You see the parents' bed, very thin, very strange. You see the bathroom, the toilet, the kitchen. So you walk through and immediately you, you give us, get a strong impression of claustrophobia and, and, and uh, narrowness and narrow-mindedness also. And yet, the, um, the most recent work that is actually at the Bass Museum and here in, um, I think in Tadeus Ropak and Lehman Maupin is you have these armatures of wood, much like you mentioned that you started using in the 80s because they almost seem like found wood or scrap wood. And you've created these almost utopian shapes out of them, this kind of sculpture, these towers, and then you pull a sweater over them and they look both futuristic and classic modernist and yet totally dysfunctional. This was um, an important step for me also because when you make shows and you, have, you work with different galleries, uh, then it seems to be that there is an, that the movement of the work became something self, uh, it's, it's like an automobile, no, how, how do you call this? It's it's an it's a system which you heavily control or nearly could not cannot control because the success of selling success of shows leads you all of a sudden in a direction and you follow behind it like Gerhard Richter always said he, his work is seems to be smarter than him and this is what I understood much later it means that the work is leading you in a way and you have to accept certain conditions and you follow it mm -hmm. and uh, it surprises you also and you have to accept this. And um, it's going on also with the work, but also in relation with galleries and museum shows. So success leads you somewhere. And then I found myself in situations where I started to repeat myself a little bit. And this I always hated. I was always interested to create new things f for me to surprise myself. I, I didn't want to become a bureaucrat in my work, just to repeat and go on with a certain idea which wi with which I had success uh, 10 years ago or so. So I'm, I'm constantly looking for new <coughs> methods, for new way of expression, and for new way of, of uh, creating the artwork. And this, the new pieces, all of a sudden gave me freedom to go back to the very early, rough, um, uh, brutal way of doing pieces, and I love it at the moment. I think maybe at this point we can open up to questions mm -hmm. from the audience. I know that they will have microphones um, for you. Um, it's a little hard with the lights right now, but does anybody have a question? And <laughs> these two ladies will provide a microphone. Yes. Uh, my name is Kathy Fox, and I'm interested in this idea that people find your work humorous, but you don't. And I, I wonder if it's a question of the use of the absurd, and that there's a absurd haha -ha and an absurd abject um, kind of a thing 
why do you think people seem to find it funny? And do you well, care that it's a totally different response than you? Oh, yeah. What? Took what? The world? Thank you. It's 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 an interesting question. What I use and what I like to use is. Um, cynicism, I call it critical cynicism, to speak about certain truth in our world and in our reality from a certain aspect, a cynical aspect. Some may call it funny. And uh, because I think it's much more easier or much easier to deal in this way with, with certain realities than uh, how it was done in the past with pathos, heaviness, and uh, when I, I mean, there are so artworks outside, they're full of pathos, full of, they make something important even more important and even more heavy. And I found this always not my way of, 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 of thinking. I found it interesting also through personal tragedy to be able to uh, look from um, another point on the reality and to be able to laugh about myself or uh, to accept stupidity and ridiculousness, although. I don't want that people see me like this, of course. So it's always in between. And then, for example, the fat car, fat car was not meant at all funny. The fat car is a fat car. And fat car in German, there's an expression, this fette auto means the car of the rich ones. So there's a contradiction. So the, rich, the fat car is not funny, but people laugh about it because it's a fat car, because it combines obesity, Society, our societies are more and more growing. Even TV now shows the people wider because they have this new system. And it's hilarious. It's strange. It's, it's also scary in a way, but people laugh about it. It's annoying, but it's a fact. Other, other question, yes. Uh, uh, hi, my name is uh, Leila Gresh, and I wanted to know I saw your show at the Bass Museum, and I wanted to know what went into the selection of the carpeting um, in the room with your monuments. Sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the color of the peach wall, if it was yeah. supposed to be like a flesh tone or a play on the architecture that were around. Yeah. Here. This is a good question also. Thank you very much. Because it, it's an ugly color, and I wanted, to, I wanted to have a color for elderly people, a, a little out of fashion. And uh, I know my parents had, in, in the living room, they had this kind of color. So, you know, the whole show in the Bass Museum is about housing. It's actually, the big pieces, I call them the bobs. They are uh, part of a fat house. And the fat house was always, when we sent fat house somewhere, it has to be cut it apart, or it was actually constructed like this. And when I saw the pieces singular standing in the room, I found them very, very fascinating and very beautiful in a way and interesting. And then I go, went on and, and um, was working on the, singular, on the single pieces and made some more, more architectural and some more human and some more, in a way, biological. So the, this work is exactly between architecture and between the human body and also the rest. So, and there is houses, yeah? and, 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 and the rest of the, of the pieces, some are called home, some are called architecture, some are called um, towers or warehouses, but they all have this housing aspect. And they wanted to create this reminiscence to a parent's home, my parent's home. Next question over here. Hello, my name is Stas, and my question is, after you establish yourself as an artist, I mean as a sculptor primarily, have you ever thought about going back and do some paintings? Do some what? Paintings. To do paintings? paintings? Yes. yes. No, but I collect painting. <laughs> I have, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm collecting art well, a little bit, and uh, I don't want to collect sculptures because I'm doing this, but I collect painting. I'm, I have a lot of tension and, and uh, attraction to painting, but I'm not going back, no. I, I use color constantly in my work. I used at the very beginning, for example, when I was des desperate not being in the painting class, I used uh, oil paint as a material and I made little balls like snowballs of, out of oil paint and they dry very slowly and they look like dumplings in Austria. You are fed with dumplings when you grow up. So this was a relation between also the daily life and, and um, sculpture and painting in a way. Next question. 
Yes. Um, my name is Holly Howe. Um, I was wondering when the Red Hot Chili Peppers did a music video that was inspired by your one minute sculptures, were you involved with that? And did you yes. find it brought a whole new audience to your work? Yes. Frankly, I didn't know the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I'm not that interested in pop music. And, um, and I got a call and uh, I said, I repeated the name in the studio, I said Red Hot Chili Pepper, and my studio, my, the people in the back were like, ah. is that okay? <laughs> and then they asked, it was actually the office of the producer, of the video producer, Mark Romanek, who called and they said they would do the, the video with the Red Hot Chili Pepper if I would agree and allow them to use the, 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 the one minute captures as an inspiration. And I said, yeah, great, of course, it's great. Because I always found it so interesting and, and, and fascinating to go with the work outside of the borders of the art world. So I made, I made uh, several times um, pieces for magazines because I found this is um, the contemporary um, public space, magazines, TV and so on. So for that reason I liked the idea very much. And of course we had this contract and one of my conditions was I want that you name me. And they did. And of course, I mean, the video was playing everywhere and it was a gigantic advertisement for my work. Also. I even came to talk shows, <laughs> but they just, they were not interested in me, they were interested in, in the others, so I was just uh, a... <laughs> Next question, I believe in the back here. My name is Kino Fukawa. Um, I was wondering, I went to the new museum in New York and I saw the um, Urs Fischer's Marguerite de Ponti show and I saw a few similarities in your piece and Urs Fischer's piece. So I was wondering if you knew about this artist or if you've interacted with them, just out of curiosity. No, I, 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 I know him, yes. Uh, he had a show um, in Switzerland and I have seen the show at that time. I haven't seen the show at the new museum and we have no collaboration or interaction, no. Next question. No? Yes, right here. What happens after Dallas? Is it going anywhere else? No, the exhibition will go back to the studio. Works this show back. not, but other shows are traveling. Website? Urbanworm.at. Easy to easy to remember. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for. Oh, well, okay. You, you mentioned Bruce Nauman influencing your work. What other artists? Um, what other, I guess, artists were highly influential in some of your work as you were developing? I didn't understand it. Which other artists influenced you other than Bruce Nauman? Joseph Boyce very much, at the very beginning. I loved it, I was kind of attracted like a flea. But then after a certain time it, it, it changed and the older you get, the more you you're find yourself like an old dog walking around alone. And I, I love old art, I love contemporary art, um, in many directions I love literature and philosophy. So the whole world inspires me, but not a specific artist. I like, men, uh, for example, the pieces, the drinking sculptures, are related, of course, to Gilbert and George and Tom Marioni, who made similar pieces. They made other pieces. They made the, 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 this uh, photographic work when they were drunk, and Tom Marioni had these beer bars and so on. So I'm very well informed about the art world and, and contemporary art. But I cannot say I have an artist whom I admire so much. It's not anymore. Well, once again, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. There is a book by um, <coughs> Dumont, uh, for those of you who are interested in Verm, and um, the Bass Museum exhibition runs through March 4th, and exhibit opens in April, mid-April in Dallas. Those of you who are here at the fair, Xavier Hufkins, Thaddeus Ropak, and Lehman Maupin Gallery, all have recent works by Ervin, if you're interested in maybe even buying a work. Um, they're all there. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.